Welcome to the Messy Antics Podcast, a podcast about all things Messianic Judaism. Each episode, we will be sharing our opinions as we tackle some of the biggest issues in Messianic Judaism. Now, here's your hosts, Rabbis Eric, David, Jonathan, and Toby. This is Rabbi Eric, and today's topic, we're going to be talking about anti-Semitism. Now, in the world around us right now, there's an uh, increase in anti-Semitism. Matter of fact, this last year, uh, there's been more anti-Semitic actions around the world than any time previous in a one-year uh, time period. So it's important that we talk about these things, especially as Messianic believers. We're part of a, a Jewish expression of our faith. But we want to dig deeper. The the things that are are openly anti-Semitic or things that are knowingly anti-Semitic, like those who would uh, say they hate the Jews or hate Israel and, and outwardly come against uh, Jewish people, is, is one thing. But we want to dig deeper into some of the things that people within the body of Messiah do that are either hidden anti-Semitism, unknowing anti-Semitism, or accidental anti-Semitism, things that are done within the body of Messiah that are seemingly accepted by people as if it doesn't isn't offensive, isn't hurtful, and doesn't diminish the nation Israel, the Jewish people, and so on, and are accepted without even thinking about the fact that these things are just that. So one of the things that I want to start out with, and I'm going to talk about two of them, and then I hope that uh, Rabbi Toby and Rabbi Jonathan and Rabbi David will join in with their thoughts and, and expressions also. But in Acts 15, there's a verse that says, and this is Acts 15, verse 5, It says, but some belonging to the party of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the Torah of Moses. Now, we're not going to get into the circumcision and Torah of Moses part of this, but when people within the body of Messiah generally talk about the Pharisees, they talk about them as if Pharisee equals hypocrite. Pharisee equals evil, Pharisee equals anything. But here we have Pharisees who believed in the Messiah, and they didn't not be Pharisees. It actually says some belonging to the party, not some who used to belong to the party, but some who belong to the party of the Pharisees and believed. So it's important that we don't make it seem that somebody who believed in the teachings of the Pharisaic community were hypocrites, that they were all hypocrites, and that Pharisee is a synonym for the word hypocrite. And that tends to be an anti-Semitic type statement. The other one I want to talk about is when people quote things, for instance, the verse that says, if my people, and and so on from... uh, If my people are called by my name. Called by my name will humble themselves themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. That verse is claimed by people, and it's amazing, especially over the last couple of years during the pandemic, during all the things going on, the pastors who proclaim that, pastors in the United States who, who proclaim that God is speaking to the church in America when he says this, when in actuality that verse was spoken to Solomon about Israel. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't hear us when we repent and that he doesn't respond to our repentance. But that verse is specifically talking to Israel, the Jewish people, and to Israel, the land, and it deals with the covenants that God made with Israel through Abraham and with Israel, the land. And the scripture actually says, I've made a covenant with the land of Israel. And so when we take and insert ourselves into, as as Americans, into that text, and especially, uh, especially if you are a non-Jewish believer and you insert yourself into that text as if it's applicable to you, There is hidden replacement theology. You're replacing Israel with the church, and you're replacing the Jewish people with the church, and you're replacing the land of Israel with the United States. Now, I want people in the United States to repent and turn back to God, and I want to see God's blessings on the United States. But I don't want to misapply Scripture and misappropriate Scripture so that it applies or we seemingly applies to a group of people separate from the initial. God's plan was that the Gentile body of believers would graft into Israel and become part of the extended commonwealth of Israel and that the promises given to Israel are eternal. 
the nation, the land of Israel, as well as the people, and we don't replace them with anybody in the process. And and these are two examples, and there are so many others in the Scripture that people quote and that pull out of context or misuse that are actually anti-Semitic. They're anti-the Jewish people. They're anti-Israel, the land, and their replacement theology inserting the church in the place of God's covenant people. And I want to jump in on that for a second and backtrack to the uh, uh, the uh, Chronicles uh, seven, you know, First Chronicles seven fourteen, and and that whole if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and so on. Um, what's really interesting with that is, as as Rabbi Eric was saying, this is Rabbi David, by the way, as Rabbi Eric was saying, uh, it's really interesting that people, especially here in the states, will quote this. We see it uh, uh, all the time in political cycles, right? Every time an election cycle rolls around, you'll see people talk about this. You'll see it up on billboards. You'll see all this kind of stuff. Um, what's interesting is people will only focus. On that one verse, and as Rabbi Eric's saying, is the context is important, right? Not just the context in who it's being spoken to and 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 the time frame and what it's about, but the actual textual context is important as well. Yeah. And that passage is at a very specific time. That verse comes uh, immediately after Israel has just completed the temple, the construction of the temple. They had just completed the uh, the the consecration and the initial uh, services of the temple. The first temple, Solomon's temple, just completed all of this. They just had this tremendously huge Sukkot celebration for the first time at the temple. And uh, Solomon is up speaking before Israel, before the people, God speaking through him and and, uh, and God speaking to him. And God says, basically, look, a time's going to come as we read in the blessings, the curse of Deuteronomy, a time's going to come that, that you know, you're going to have some prosperity for a while. Things are going to go great. But then the people of Israel are going to turn their hearts against me. And they're going to start chasing after the gods of the lands around them, the people around them. They're going to start doing all of the things I said not to do. And when that time comes, then this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. And if after all of these terrible things happen, Israel then humbles themselves, turns from their evil ways, and turns back to me. And and, and we like to take that one verse out of context because it's convenient and it fits the narrative we're trying to push. But as Rabbi Eric said, it is, and in a lot of ways, it's very, and I think unintentional, but it's a, a very unintentional anti-Semitic uh, situation because it takes Israel out of the context of the text. It takes the body of Messiah out of the context of the grafting into the commonwealth of Israel. Uh, it takes the the reality, the importance, the prophetic importance of the temple out of the context. Uh, and, and we start to bastardize the text to make it say what we want it to say rather than to pay attention to what it's actually about. Yeah, right. it becomes and, like a uh, – this is Rabbi Jonathan. It almost becomes like this very weird – and it's kind of like a Republican campaign slogan. It's like, if you would stop voting Democrat, God would heal our land. And I'm not disagreeing with that necessarily, but at the same time, it's a, um, it, it it gets used in ways that just, yeah, it, right. it it's makes it... It's misapplied and misappropriated. Weird. And, and it, it really is, we, we don't think about it in the body, but it really is anti-Semitic, and it's, it violates the nature of God's covenants, because God's covenant was to the Jew first, and also equally the non-Jew. Right. And it's, it's a process that through the seed of Abraham, which ultimately is Yeshua, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And if you remove the Jewish element, the, the element of Israel, the covenant God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from that context, then you have this island of the church that stands out there by their own by their own selves that has no connection to the actual covenant God made, but yet they're depending on that covenant that God made for their redemption. In other words, they're depending on the covenant to come to fullness while they're actually rejecting the covenant that is what they're hoping for. So it's it really is a dangerous thing, and it's, it's anti-Semitism, it's anti-God, it's anti-biblical all at the same time. But these things happen. It's very much like when people say things like the Old Testament, that was for the Jewish people, and the New Testament, that's for the church. And all the things that we deal with, for instance, even when people talk about uh, end times, where they talk about, you know, that God's coming to take his church out, and then the Jewish people will suffer for killing Messiah and suffer for the rejection of Messiah, but that at the end of the thousand years, God will then redeem the Jews that survive that 
uh, that period. And, and at the end of the persecution and tribulation, God will rescue the, those Jews that held on through their suffering and were purified by this evil that was laid upon them, by this judgment that was laid upon them, and then they could have the opportunity to be saved. So can I throw out a uh, another thing that kind of fits right along with this and again it follows suit with what you're talking about taking stuff out of context and its relation to Israel and making it fit something else and that's in Genesis chapter 12 beginning with verse 1 this is in Parsha Lech Lecha uh, Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 says then Adonai said to Avram get going out from your land and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you my heart's desire is to make you into a great nation to bless you to make your name great so that you may be a blessing my desire is to bless those who bless you but whoever curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed and I've heard that verse verse 3 said so many times in terrible context particularly the my desire is to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and I've heard so many people so many pastors and such in churches and and listen this isn't like a blanket statement I'm not saying every church does this or every church brings it up that but we are talking about unintentional anti-semitism that it's important for us to recognize uh what we're talking about what we're saying and so I've heard pastors who will use this, they'll, they'll read this verse, they'll talk about, oh, we have a heart for Israel, we love the Jewish people, we want to pray over the Jewish people, and they'll they'll take a moment to pray for Israel, but they'll read this verse, and here's why we do this, because the Word of God says, those that bless Israel will be blessed, and those that curse Israel will be cursed, and we want to be blessed, so we want to bless Israel, and we're going to pray over Israel. But it's not because they want to see Israel come to salvation, it's not because they have a love for Israel where they actually care to see Israel blessed, but but it's because there's this natural or this unnatural yearning for this mythical blessing that comes with having said something about it's, Israel. It's actually and, a selfishness yeah. that brings about. Yeah. I, I want to receive my blessings, so I'll say these words. Yeah, so that and I I've, can get it. And I've actually seen it in the worst. And this one's the one that it drives me nuts when it's done wrong, done this way. But but this is the one that's even worse to me. Is I actually know of churches where the pastor will specifically say this read this verse, verse 3 of Genesis 12, and then say, now we're going to pray over Israel before we take up our offering because the word of God says those that bless Israel will be blessed and those that curse Israel will be cursed. And so we're going to bless Israel and then take up of our offering. And the whole thing is extremely manipulative, extremely uh, 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 conniving. And it's not about blessing Israel. Israel. It's not about blessing the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's about trying to get that material blessing, that mythical blessing we think comes along with it. Um, and, and to me, that is, in my opinion, I think the most anti-Semitic thing that we could we could do is to to care less about the salvation of the Jewish people than about what we can get out of praying and loving. Well, the there's Jewish there's people. there's one that bothers me even more than that because there's there's one thing when people want to. Uh, manipulate this verse so that and and out of selfish reasons so that they can receive something here in this world. But the one that gets me even worse is when people say they're praying that Jewish people will come to faith so that because they came to faith, then Yeshua will return to take his church out of this world. It's why we're not praying for Jewish people to come to faith so that they'll come to faith and have a relationship with the Messiah or so that we'll see a revival among the Jewish people. But we're asking that God would bring that very last Jewish person that's going to be saved into the body so that the rest of us can be pulled out of there. Uh, It's a very selfish, very anti-Semitic replacement theology kind of context that people say. Um, I I think in my experience, um, and this is Rabbi Toby. Um, a lot of it is really simply just a lack of understanding the scripture and not reading it in its entirety and not reading it in its historical context. Uh, 99% of the Bible was written by Jewish people. Um, the, the Jewish people were chosen. Uh, they were the firstborn of God's people. Uh, they were given the oracles. They were given the words of God. Um, and, and, it, it was for God's plan of salvation for the world, and, and we've talked about this. You know, you know, God's regard and love for Jew and non-Jew is the same, but God has a pattern for salvation. He had a pattern for His plan to save the world. Um, I, I look at it for an example. I look at John chapter eight when Yeshua is. Um, now, now, listen. I just want to say context. Yeshua in His three-year ministry, He. It, it, 
in the in the gospels the the people that he is dialoguing with the most is jewish people his followers were mostly jewish people his opponents were mostly jewish people he was with his people so of course the people following him would be jewish but we but his opponents were also jewish but i think too and i i, I it could be just bad translation in the scripture like when you read the new testament it says and the jews said and the jews said and the jews said to him yeah you know and and it almost becomes i think people are in in the church are indoctrinated into the fact that the villains in the gospel were the jews yeah well and, and part of that comes from the idea that you know well and you have to read it how it's written you know there's right. thousands of people around him following him you uh, you think all of them in one unified voice were saying and they know, were jews coming against him yeah no it's, right there were jews following him and jews opposing him right yeah and, and usually it when it gets to that point you know and the jews opposed him or and the jews sought to you know you know bring him down overthrow him or to throw him into a trap it's always speaking of a select group a small group and usually it's those who are in some kind of leadership um is uh, usually where we and and so because of that and then I also take into account the letters of Paul, where the, I, I would say Paul, one of Paul's opponents was a group called the Circumcision. And I think just a lack of understanding, a lack of the context, and just t- and, and just taking it piecemeal, just taking the whole thing. I don't know if I piecemeal is the proper term, but they just take the whole thing and say, so they connect circumcision to the Torah, they connect Jews to the Torah. So, well, it's all bad, and Yeshua freed us from that. Jesus freed us from that. So we don't have to do any of that stuff. We, as long as we love Jesus, we can do anything we want, and that is not what God intended. Yeah. And I, I'll give you another example. I had a family member at a dinner table. Uh, the the scriptures came up, and we were eating breakfast. And my, okay, I was about to ask, was this Thanksgiving? No, it was, was breakfast. Just okay. one random breakfast. But my family member, in particular, was eating bacon. I was not, and we're sitting there just kind of chatting and. And they made a point to say, well, you know, it's just like, you know, with Peter, you know, when God made that revelation of Peter about the animals and acts, you know, that was to make all food clean. And I just, it was such a ridiculous statement that I had to just sigh and just, I just said, I just changed the subject. I just didn't want to say, are you serious? You think that the revelation God gave to Peter was about food? Now, now that might not come across as anti-Semitic at the outset, but I think it is. It is an anti-Semitic interpretation because yeah. it's destroying kosher. Well, and it, what it does is, and you know, I've heard about this practice before, where it was normal for a lot of, Pro- Amer- especially American Protestant churches, where if a Jewish person came to faith, mm-hmm. they, a lot of them would actually take him home or out to eat, and they would make like, "Hey, here's a ham sandwich. You know, you're a Christian now. You can, right. uh, you know, now go completely against what yeah. you know, God has ordained for I- you to do in you, in your life." And it, that's just yeah. like, and see. That interpretation of that passage, which is wrong, it just proves you didn't actually read the whole. Uh, or you know, usually they don't read the whole thing, the whole uh, right. vision, so, and yeah. then it results in taking your Jewish friend out for a ham sandwich. Yeah. So, and Rabbi Eric and Rabbi David can speak up, but for me, it is the misinterpretation of the of the Besorah, the, the, which is the Gospels, and Paul's writings has created the idea of the Jewish people in the Torah as these opponents. To, 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 to the freedom that Yeshua provides, Jesus provides. Right. And when we talk about the, the vision that Peter has, we have to remember that this vision was given to Peter as a Jewish man right. to give him permission to go share the good news to a non-Jewish person. Right. Not to make Peter not Jewish, and actually when he or declare, does – Or declare all foods or clean. Or declare pork clean. And then it goes on and it says that with – Paul, uh, Peter go, going to Cornelius' household, a group of other Jewish men came with him to witness what was going on. And then Cornelius became a believer, and the statement was, "Who should we? how should we refuse water that he shouldn't get immersed because he received the Holy Spirit or the Ruach HaKodesh in the same way we did? Right. And so this was a comparison of Gentiles becoming believers in the same way that Jewish people did. The right. Jewish people didn't stop being Jewish to become believers, and the Gentiles didn't become Jewish, but they received the same redemption the same way with the same power of the same Ruach and the same response in being filled with the Ruach. And so you're right, uh, Rabbi Toby, that when we deal with these things, there's a 
And again, you said uh, you don't think they intend to, and it's true. And the whole reason we're talking about this hidden or accidental anti-Semitism is because the vast majority of believers in a church somewhere or gathering together to worship somewhere are not knowingly saying, I'm going to say this or do this or right. recite this or claim this so that I can be anti-Semitic. Of course, right. But if you're on the receiving end, if you're listening, if, if you're a Jewish person and you're hearing these things said, like we need to unhitch from the Torah, or uh, as someone said just recently in a, a sermon, that Saturday Sabbath is a demonic doctrine, those things are effectively anti-Semitic against the Jewish people and the covenants that God made with the Jewish people and, by extension, the Gentile community that has grafted into the nation Israel and into those covenants. And it, it really is something that the body needs to be aware of because unless you honestly dialogue about these issues, there will always be a schism and a separation Mm -hmm. between the Jewish believers and those who have aligned with the Jewish believers in a Messianic community or or, uh, in in something like that, or and the church which has separated itself Mm -hmm. from the Jewish community and reads the scriptures in the way that the the Jews are the Hatfields and the church is the McCoys, and, and you can't bring that together. Prime example of of kind of what you're dealing with here, um, and it goes back to what uh, Rabbi Toby was saying about sometimes how uh, the the inflection that is imposed in the text and the translation of you know how they choose to use the word Jew in certain translations and so on. Um, a prime example of this is the word synagogue in the Greek, uh, which is where we get the word synagogue from today in Judaism and in the King James Version uh, in its original translation. Uh, they went out of their way if the word synagogue was used in the Greek in the Brachadasha in a positive connotation. It was translated to church. Even though it never meant church, and the word church actually came from a German word and had nothing to do with anything you see in the Greek or what was going on in the first century, um, it would be translated to church if, it, if synagogue was used in a positive connotation. If it was used in a negative connotation, they translated to synagogue mm-hmm. to intentionally impose uh, the assumption that synagogues and anything Jewish is negative. It's a bad thing. It's something that right. Christians or believers are supposed to stay away from and uh, and, and so on. Now, this isn't a knock on the KJV. Don't get me wrong. Like, I don't know anybody today that speaks like that, so it just reads weird to me. Uh, but so, it is, some people are diehard KJV yeah, only. Yeah, I don't understand that, but that's but another, it's, another topic. But it, it's not a terrible translation in of itself. Uh, but it does have some very terrible translational in, intentional translational like issues, East, like Easter. Yeah, that are yeah, like Easter <laughs> twice in uh, Acts, I believe it is that uh, the the word Paschal is translated to Easter, yeah. even though it didn't exist in uh, the the when the Book of Acts was written, right? So, yeah, or at least not as a Christian. Which is another example of the anti-Semitism. Yeah, right. Yeah, Inserted into of, it. Right. They're replacing a Moadim with Christian celebrations, even though they weren't in existence in the first century when the the, the New Testament was written. Right, right. and it, it leads into the same thing where you know Paul is said to have to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Well, actually, the the word Gentile means nations, mm-hmm. and it doesn't necessarily mean Gentile people, but people in Gentile outside lands of outside of Israel. And so Paul would go to Ephesus or Corinth or wherever he traveled to, and he would speak mm-hmm. in a synagogue, and then he would – uh, after uh, moving, God moved in the synagogue. There are times where they invited him to leave the synagogue because of disagreements uh, in, about Yeshua. But lar- most of the time, he worshipped in synagogues with the rest of the Jewish community, and their revival happened as a result of being in the synagogue. Yeah. And it wasn't the church that he went to uh, because the Jewish people rejected him and because the Jewish people rejected Messiah. But it was the synagogue he went to where there were Jewish people and non-Jewish people worshiping together. And then from that uh, expanded this revival that reached through the nations with the message of the Jewish Messiah for the nations. I wanted to interject real quick that uh, on the topic of anti-Semitism, the past, I guess now three years almost, two years, almost three years, the um, we've seen such a rise in anti-Semitism. I think largely because 
um, with the onset of COVID-19, you had an explosion of interest into the world of conspiracy theories. Now, look, I'm not saying... Well, Say it ain't so. Uh, yeah, I know. So I think uh, that's a conspiracy theory. It probably is a conspiracy, but... Anyway, I, I'm not... You know, look, I'm not going to say get into too much detail about conspiracies and why you know some of it's nonsense and maybe 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 some of it's legit don't know but you have to remember the history surrounding the atmosphere of conspiracy theories really you know begins uh, sort of pre-world war one with you know the introduction by um uh, the russians with which you know they just they disseminated you know booklets you call it the protocols of the elders of zion it was sort of this you know uh miss uh, it's a pseudepigraphic work that is which means that it was not written by the people that it was attributed to so it, you know, it was written by um purported actually not even purportedly it's just understood factually to be written by russian intelligence um which you know they said that, that zionists are you know out get the world they control all the money in the world they control all the higher powers in the world and so you know that leads to all these different things where oh my goodness drug trade human sex trafficking like you know it's got to have you know transportation and money somewhere so it must be the jews behind it and that's where you know you get that's where a lot of the germans got their rhetoric leading up to um uh, you know, Kristallnacht and you know, a lot of the Nazi positions uh, in Europe and, uh, and, you know, okay, the Nazis get defeated, that kind of dies down a little bit, well, then it kind of gets reintroduced with the Cold War, you know, uh, well, the Jews are behind, you know, the, 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 the rearmament of, you know, the Soviet Union and, and they're they're mostly communists anyway, so they must be behind China and Russia against the United States, and so you get this anti-Semitic attitude in the United States, you know, from late 60s into the 80s, kind of dies down for, you know, a couple decades and then you know you get to something like COVID nineteen, and then all of a sudden, you know you have a resurgence in things like uh, you know Black Hebrew Israelites, you know you, uh, people denying the identity of Israel and the Jewish people who have been tracing their lineage for uh, centuries or millennium. My, or my favorite are the Holocaust deniers. Holocaust deniers, right. which by the way, just so people are aware, you know, watch out who you support in politics because. When they interact with people who are active Holocaust deniers, you know, it's it's so funny to me that the Holocaust happened not even 100 years ago. And we have people who is not even 100 years removed who are denying – well, we have people who are alive today who saw the camps, who saw – Jews being carted off from their villages. You know, we, ha- we have you – know, uh, you know, I've – you know, I, I grew up in Germany. I lived in Germany uh, m- most of my younger years where you would have the older folks talk about, you know, they weren't completely aware, but they knew something was happening because all of a sudden their Jewish neighbors were being, you know, rounded up and right. carted off to the tra- to the railroads yeah. and, 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 and disappearing. Um, and then, of course, in other countries in Europe, it was a lot more obvious, places like Holland and France, where the Germans act aggressively, you know, took right. over. And, it, and it's important as we talk about these things to realize that, that throughout history, you know, we had the Egyptians, then we had the Spanish Inquisition, we had the Crusades, we had the Russian pogroms, we had the Holocaust. All of these are very overt and very outward anti-Semitic things as well as mm-hmm. the things that we see that people are openly anti-Jewish and openly anti-Israel. Yeah. But it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's these little right. hidden things that people say and do that really do cause division and hurt and, and such. And so when we talk about these things, like when, as Rabbi Toby said, when we talk about the Jews as the bad guys and the Christians as the good guys, right. or and those things, you remember when in, in Acts 12, when Paul goes back to Jerusalem to report what God is doing among the Gentile nations through his ministry – the accusation against Paul was not that he believed in Yeshua. And these are people accusing him at the temple. This is, he's going to the temple. He's going to yeah. make offerings. He's there. These are Jewish people, and they're not saying, we're, we're accusing you of being a bad Jew because you believe in Yeshua. They say, we're accusing you of being a bad Jew because you're teaching Jews and the nations not to follow the law of Moses and to not circumcise their children. That's the accusation against Paul by the Jewish believers who are coming against him there. And the answer is by James, go and make a sacrifice to show these people that you are not turning away from Jewish uh, law, Jewish 
customs, Jewish instructions, the Torah itself, in your observance and lifestyle for Messiah. And we have to remember that the, being Jewish was not contrary to faith in Messiah. It's actually the essence. Right. Judaism is the essence of the faith of Messiah. Now, of course, over the years, Judaism has functionally changed from what it was in the days of the temple with the sacrificial system and the priest and all that. So there are differences in modern Judaism, large, a lot of them from what would be temple Judaism. But Judaism in and of itself is not contrary to faith in the Messiah of Israel, yeah. who is the expected retu- uh, re- king and ruler of the people Israel. You know, the, we can all agree the most important person in Scripture is the Messiah. Yeshua, he's the most important person. Absolutely. You know, of course, it's, you know, he was fully God, fully man. So, of course, I'm not, it, it, God is, the story is God's story, but the Messiah is his ultimate expression yeah. uh, uh, and, and, and how he's saving the world. And, and it's the ultimate expression. Yeshua is the ultimate embodiment of, of, of who God is and uh, in every way. And it's interesting that the times I've been in conversations with, Brothers and sisters, and I'm saying brothers and sisters in the church, because we're not saying these are salvation issues, but it's a problem, and I'll tell you why. The times I've been in conversation or, you know, gentle debate with brothers and sisters in the church, the number one person they quote isn't the Messiah, isn't the Lord and all the prophecy, it's Paul. It's Paul. Paul is like the hero of why the the, the church does what it does. And it's interesting because uh, if you read Romans, you get to this part where Paul says something so intense and radical. He says, I would give up my salvation Mm -hmm. for the salvation of Israel. And I once heard a pastor give a message on this. It was on a um, a radio. Uh, It was was like just a a broadcast. I was driving and listening to this guy. Um, And he was talking about this. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. This is a pastor who has a heart for Israel, and there's plenty of those. There are, yeah, but 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 still, I, not enough in my opinion. But he said he starts talking about you know Paul wanted to give up his salvation for the Jewish people. He wanted to, he was willing to do that. Could he do it? No, no. But he wanted to do it. He and then and then and I was like, oh wow, this is great. And then he said it. He goes, wherever you come from, whoever your people are, you need a heart for your people like that. And I'm like, no, that's. That's not what Paul's saying. He's saying every believer has to have a heart for the salvation of Israel because it's key to God's plan. You know? Right. And and remember that one of the reasons that the, the church looks at Paul, and again, this is another uh, hidden anti-Semitic thing, is Paul is this guy who used to be the Jewish guy, Shaul, Shaul who was the rabbi. Yep. Right. And, and now he name changed. The but, it, but, when he, but when he became a Christian, he converted from Judaism to Christianity, and now he's the hero of Christianity when that's not at all what takes place. Paul and Shaul. I have a Hebrew name. It's Asa David. My English name is Eric. Both names are my name today. I don't have, uh, you know. So, so Paul has a, a Hebrew name and he has a a uh, Roman English, name. It's English name. English now, <laughs> Paul. But he has the two names because he's a Roman citizen and a Jewish citizen, Israeli citizen at the same time. He's got the two names, and he did not change his name to Paul when he stopped being Jewish. And became a Christian. Right. Uh, in, in the same Primarily way, Primarily because he didn't stop. He yeah. never stopped being Jewish, and he never yeah. stopped following Judaism. He never but, stopped being a Pharisee. But yeah. that statement that Paul became a Christian and walked away from his Judaism is anti-Semitic in and of itself. Yeah, and it changes the dialogue and the history and the context of the entirety. Of Paul's ministry in his life. Yeah, yeah. I, I had two names when I was at Fort Knox too. It was my my buddies called me Riston and my drill sergeants called me Hey You. And then uh, so you know you can have more than one name. When, so it works. And, and here's the thing. Here's what's most important about this discussion of of uh, um, unintentional anti-Semitism in the church and and in general just anti-Semitism in the church. Like it's it's a problematic thing for a bunch of reasons. Uh, but the number one is that Israel is God's chosen people. And and you know uh, Romans, we just talked about this last night in our Bible study. Romans one sixteen. For I am not ashamed of the good news of Messiah, for it is the power of salvation for all who will believe. To the Jew first, and 
also to the Gentile or also to the nations. Right, and that also and, word in Greek means equally or the same yeah, manner. Yeah. And so the the reality is is that Israel is God's chosen people. Israel was chosen by God, as Genesis 12 says that we read earlier, for the distinct purpose of providing the seed through whom the entire world, including Israel, would be blessed. And to Israel pre- is... And to also to preserve the oracles yeah. of God. And Israel Israel was never done away with. God did not stop his love, did not cut off his covenants or his promises to the Jewish people. Instead, he enhanced those promises by adding to that promise, not only will he bless you, not only does he love you, not only will he establish you in the land, but he will also provide salvation for you because Yeshua says he will not return until all Israel says, right. blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Paul says that he will not stop until all Israel is saved, and then when all Israel is saved, it will be like life from the dead. It will be revival for the body for the of Messiah. Yeah. And he goes on in Romans 11, verse 16, says, if the first fruit is holy, so is the whole batch of dough holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, speaking to the nations, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and become a partaker of the root of the olive tree with its richness, do not boast against the branches. Against what branches? the natural branches that were cut off. But if you do boast, it is not you who support the root, but the root who supports you. You will say then branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True enough. They were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Do not become arrogant, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. So it's important for the body to awaken to the reality that we cannot separate ourselves from our Jewish roots and our Jewish heritage. We cannot purport uh, anti-Semitism as a Christian idea, because if you do, you are very literally living out the the command of Paul to not boast against the Jewish people and against Israel because of your salvation that comes through the Jewish people and through Israel because of the seed of Messiah. And remember, as we bring this episode to a close, that Paul specifically says there that if the root was holy, Mm -hmm. then you're holy. So he's saying that the nation Israel is still holy even though they have not fully accepted Messiah because they would be coming to Messiah as time goes on. The second thing is the greatest evidence for the accuracy and truth of the Bible is the existence of Israel as a nation today. And so we want to encourage you, if you've listened to this episode today and you're wondering uh, you know, do I have this within me? Is there is there something within me? Have I been to – maybe I need to pay attention to how I talk, how I review the scriptures, how I look at these things. Because it is really important that we understand that the power and strength of the body of Messiah today is the fact that it is connected and one with the historical body of Israel throughout history all the way to Abraham. And if we're divided over things like – anti-Semitism, which is a form of hatred against a group of people, then we need to search, let God search our heart, let the Spirit touch us, and repent of that. I, I, well, I just want to say, uh, and, and in your prayer life, of course, pray for the salvation of the world. Pray for the salvation of your lost family members. We're not saying that one person's more important than the other, but place a, a, a special emphasis on praying for the salvation of, of all Israel, because that is the key to the return of Messiah. And, and I want to, as we get ready to close, I want to throw this out because I don't want anybody to think that we spent the entire episode beating up on the church or, or, or anything like that. Um, because, listen, here's the thing, uh, and this became a bit of a, a uh, kind of slap in the face realization scenario for one of us this week, is that unfortunately in the Messianic movement, we have a very uh, – we are very guilty often – of being exactly what I just said, of being people who beat up on the church, who bash the church. And listen, we're rolling into the Christmas season. We don't really want to do an episode on that, but I do want to say, listen, as much as we've talked about the body cannot be anti-Semitic, the Messianic Jewish movement cannot hate on the church. Or the Gentiles. Or Gentiles. And listen, and we're guilty of it, like all the time. Look, I don't celebrate Christmas and Easter because I don't see it being biblical, and, and, and I see those events that they're celebrating as having occurred within the biblical calendar that was laid out by God for his appointed days for prophetic purposes, and I observe those things and celebrate those things and commemorate those things when they occurred on the Hebrew calendar, on the biblical calendar, but I also do not believe in the least 
that the average believer, the average Christian in celebrating Christmas and Easter are doing so because of the pagan roots way, way, way back in, his, in its, its lineage, uh, I believe the Kavanah, the intention of the heart of our Christians, brothers and sisters celebrating Christmas, uh, is very much in the right place. Right, and- I, I don't think that they're celebrating at the right time, and that is what it is, but it's not something that we need to create even bigger division of. We just talked about, Rabbi Eric just talked about how we can't be divided in the body of Messiah over hatred towards the Jewish people. And in the same sense, Messianic Judaism, we cannot continue to divide ourselves from our brothers and sisters in the blood of Messiah over things that are not salvational issues, such as their celebration of Christmas. If if the Lord's not already working on their heart distinctively and intentionally uh, to, to draw them towards the Moedim, it's not our job to do God's job for him. He'll take care of it when it's time. Right. I was saying earlier in our just talking amongst ourselves, if somebody spends more time trying to rescue people from the Christmas tree than they do trying to point people to the cross, then we have a real problem. And if we will focus on pointing people to Yeshua, he is well able to take care of those things that may not align with uh, the lifestyle and what the Bible actually teaches about things. Those things will work their way out. Now, that doesn't mean if somebody asks us a question, you know, do you celebrate Christmas or do you do this or do you do that, that we don't answer them uh, honestly yeah. and truthfully because Christmas is not part of my yeah. culture and life. Yeah. So it's not something that I've, I uh, work, uh, participate in. But in the same tone, I want people to believe in Yeshua. If if we let God's spirit touch their heart, they'll want to learn from us, and that will open the door to them being taught, educated. In the same way we're talking about this anti-Semitism that people don't know they're doing, we're hoping that if we point people to Messiah and to what the scriptures actually say, that they will then respond to his spirit and humble themselves and, and repent of this so that we can be unified. Likewise, with all the other trappings that have been introduced to both Christianity and Judaism, if it doesn't line up with God's word, then we shouldn't be involved in it, whether it's Judaism or Christianity. But we need to be honest about it, and we need to point people to Messiah and to the word of God and let the word of God bring about change in their life. Yeah, and I think practically, just for some anti 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 Semitism things. You you know, be careful about what you share on things like Facebook. If you follow blogs and videos of people who are counter narr- counter narrative, counter media, definitely be careful about what kind of things you share because oftentimes um and I've seen it people share things unintentionally that then it turns around that this person has, you know, some uh, questionable ideas and thoughts towards the Jewish people and towards Israel. Um, I used to follow a journalist myself, a Canadian journalist who was very counter narrative for years, and I had no idea. And then I found out one day that she was very, very, very anti Israel. Um, and so I had to quit following her um, uh, just because she was, um, it ended up being very nasty. And so just watch who you're listening to, watch who you're sharing. Because if you, you know, for example, if you're, if you're a voice in your community, in your church, if you're a Sunday school leader, your pastor, and you are sharing, uh, videos and things. And look, I, I'm totally cool with questioning the narrative that the media pushes on society today. But if you're sharing stuff by people that's um, revolves around being anti-Jewish, being anti-Israel, then your people who follow you, who listen to you, who look up to you, they're going to either be led down that path themselves, um, or or you know, if you're doing, it, especially if you're doing it unintentionally, they may become very intentional and they're and, and developing a hatred for Judaism, for Jews, for Israel. Right. Um. So be just be careful about the things you share and the things you associate with. Absolutely. And the same goes to certain political leaders who need to be more careful about who they associate with. Yeah, absolutely. And so as we close today, take some time and think about uh, how do you view the Jews in the New Covenant writings? How do you view the things that are of that? How do you view Israel as the covenant people of God? Listen to the teachers that you're listening to and see how they view it. And see if you don't pick up on this hidden or accidental anti-Semitism within the body. And then be someone who encourages, teaches, instructs, and brings light to where there's darkness. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a blessing to have you with us. 
Thank you for listening to the Messy Antics Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. And be sure to follow and interact with us on social media at Messy Antics Podcast.